listening to Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is April 23rd, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Our presenter is Dr. Hannah Newhouse. She's an allergy immunology fellow at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Good morning, everyone. This is the first hour of COLA for April 23rd, 2021. Um, This morning, we have one of our first year fellows, Hannah Newhouse, um, presenting um, on a topic that you all need to know about. Um, We don't see it as much in pediatrics as you do in adults. Um, However, it is uh, not uncommon in patients with cystic fibrosis. um, And um, and they, it's always um, a favored area to ask board questions on. So another reason to to um, have some knowledge of this, but um, uh, for both of these topics. So I'm going to have um, Dr. Newhouse give us a talk today on allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and also on hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So she's got a lot to cover, so I'll let her take it away. Yeah, thanks, Dr. D. All right. Good morning, everybody. So like Dr. D said, I'm presenting on ABPA and um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So to kind of start us off, we'll um, start off with allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So just kind of an introduction here to ABPA. So um, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So it's a progressive disease um, that you get from um, hypersensitivity to aspergillus, usually aspergillus fumigatus that has been colonized in the airways. Um, so aspergillus fumigatus is the most common fungi that cause this, um, but you can have other fungi that also um, have been implicated in this and can colonize the airway and ca- cause an ABPA-like picture. Um, then these kind of um, these other fungi include other aspergillus species. Um, as well as candida, and when it's um, when it's a uh, fungi that is not Aspergillus fumigatus, then we typically um, categorize it as allergic bronchopulmonary mycosis rather than Aspergillosis. So um, overall, just Aspergillus itself is pretty ubiquitous throughout nature. It um, likes to um, likes to um, kind of grow in decaying kind of vegetable matter, um, as well as kind of some warm, damp areas um, throughout the home. Um, and but it can be a um, opportunistic pathogen, and some um, that have kind of a breakdown in local immunity, um, impu- impaired mucociliary clearance, and kind of existing lung disease. Um, and so that's why you typically, um, a lot of times, you'll see ABPA in patients that um, with that existing lung disease with cystic fibrosis, asthma, and then um, I was interested to find out there's a few uh, that it can also affect patients with um, COPD, um, but I wasn't quite as familiar with that. So that was um, interesting to learn. Um, Oops, there we go. So um, as far as kind of other stats around ABPA, so um, typically um, in patients that have been diagnosed for asthma for um, more than a decade, um, typically, have um, are the ones that typically have ABPA. They're the ones that have had asthma for a long, a long period of time. Um, and so the overall prevalence of ABPA in the asthma population is about 12.9%. All that number can vary. Um, and then the cystic fibrosis population, we see it around a little bit less. It's 8.9%. Um, it does have some link to A to P, um, and then there's no specific gender predilection for ABPA. Um, and so a lot of times, like Dr. D was saying, um, it's typically more of a thing for our adult patients, and so usually presents around the third to fourth decade um, of life, and a lot of them have had, um, have had pre-existing lung disease for, for quite a period of time. Um, and then otherwise your um, the um, toll like receptors kind of with the immunology portion here the TLRs um, two four and nine are um, particularly important for 
um, immunity to aspergillus. So um, as far as kind of how a BPA starts off in a susceptible individual, um, so typically those fungal spores from the Aspergillus fumigatus are um, pretty small and can be inhaled down into that lower airway and alveoli and kind of set up there. Um, they can adhere to that respiratory epithelium. And then um, that adherence to that respiratory epithelium accentuates the, um, it kind of accentuates cellular dysfunction and ciliary dysmotility and disruption. So that way they kind of um, set up shop there and stay there. And then the fungal hyphae can um, can invade kind of between the epithelium. And so this is not really typically considered an invasive disease, but they can kind of nestle in between the epithelium and, and cause enough um, enough where they can recruit um, the um, immune system and recruits inflammatory cells. Um, typically, it's a little bit more of a Th2 um, predominant inflammatory response more than Th1. Um, so with that Th2 response, we're going to get recruitment and, um, and release of IL-4 and IL-5 and IL-13. Um, and then with that, you're going to get an increase in total IgE as well as aspergillus um, fumigata specific IgE levels. And then you can also get an eosinophilic response and then mast cell degranulation within that lung tissue. And so after all that kind of inflammatory response has, um, has started, um, you get kind of early and late phase um, inflammatory response and that inflammation can cause that tissue damage within the lungs. And so, um, so like I said, you kind of, we talked a little bit about this already, but um, how you can have local inflammatory TH2 response that causes that IL-4, IL-13, and IL-5 release with increased IgE and eosinophilia. Um, so overall, you get, um, um, you get airway inflammation, um, mucus production, and then overall get airway hyperreactivity. And then overall, just that chronic inflammation um, is what from that aspergillus colonization um, and that um, subsequent immune response to that is what leads to lung damage with bronchiectasis and potentially lung fibrosis if, um, if long standing. So this was um, a figure from Middleton's um, chapter 58. Um, so it talks a little bit about how um, how uh, aspergillus kind of the ABPA gets started and sets up shop. So you kind of have this pre-existing lung disease typically with asthma or cystic fibrosis. Um, and then um, you have kind of that um, with that kind of genetic susceptibility as well as the um, with asthma and CF and then um, impaired mucus um, clearance, then you get kind of that facilitates your um, aspergillus growth in the airways and the fungal activity um, in the airways kind of releases that antigen. And then it kind of it goes into the different kind of things that we talked about with, um, with kind of you get this epithelial barrier dysfunction um, because of that invasion of the um, aspergillus human goddess kind of amongst the, um, amongst the epithelial airway epithelial cells. And then it further impairs your um, mucociliary clearance and then it activates your innate immune system with release of inflammatory cytokines and you get your early and late phase reactions with um, subsequent kind of mast cell degranulation cytokine release. Um, and then that inflammatory response is what causes your bronchiectasis and um, your fibrosis in the long term. Um, and then this again is kind of going a little bit more in depth into, um, into our TH2 response and our release of IL-4 um, and IL-13. Um, and then that kind of stimulates the B cell response to, um, to release IgE um, as well as IgG and IgA. But then you have IL-5 release that's going to cause more of your eosinophil um, um, production and recruitment. And then that's going to cause your eosinophilic inflammation in the lungs as well. So um, how do um, patients with ABPA typically present? So, like we said, it kind of, um, they typically have asthma or cystic fibrosis and or occasionally COPD, but mostly asthma or CF. 
And um, with that, the presentation of ABPA can look a lot like um, just the recurrent exacerbations of their underlying disease. Um, so, um, so typically they'll have kind of cough and they can have, um, can have brown sputum um, along with their um, kind of a productive cough. Um, they can have wheezing. Um, they can sometimes have fever, um, malaise, and weight loss from their um, from their um, underlying lung disease, as well as from their um, from the inflammatory response from ABPA. Um, and then additionally, um, you kind of think about these patients. You can think about ABPA a lot of times in your uncontrolled asthmatics, particularly in our clinics, um, in our adult um, patients with uncontrolled asthma, despite having that adequate treatment. And those are typically the ones we think of that, that should be screened for ABPA. So um, as far as kind of getting labs on these patients, so um, if, you, um, if you were to get kind of um, these labs, which a lot of them can be um, helpful for diagnosis, um, then a lot of times you would see that elevated total IgU level from that TH2 heavy response, um, as well as um, elevated total eosinophil count. Um, so your um, elevated, um, your total IgE level can be, um, it's usually greater than 1,000, but um, it has been um, diagnosis has been reported in, in less than that, but it's typically greater than 1,000 IU per ml. Um, and then you typically get your elevated eosinophil count. Um, and then um, if you um, if you went, do kind of assess for specific IgE to aspergillus, then you will typically have um, positive specific IgE. Um, and that is can be via you know, your blood testing or whether you do skin testing on these patients. And then um, you can have precipitins or um, precipitating IgG antibodies to aspergillus. Um, and then if you were to do sputum cultures on these patients, um, if you were able to collect that, they would um, they can grow aspergillus, but um, otherwise um, have also have evidence just of overall just like fungal elements as well, like you're just your fungal hyphae. Um, and then you can have your charcoal Leiden crystals. So typically, serum galactamine is not super useful for the diagnosis of ABPA, like it would be for more of an invasive, um, invasive uh, aspergillus picture. So it's typically um, not something that is super useful for this. So um, on imaging, um, you would typically see, you know, yeah, a lot of times start with our chest x-ray first, and you can see infiltrates that um, are kind of can migrate and kind of re resolve with, um, with treatment. Um, and then you can also have just atelectasis with a lot of, you have mucus plugging, so then you get atelectasis from your mucus plugging. And... Um, and then um, I found out you can have your what's called high attenuation mucus. Um, so that's kind of a little bit more like that's mucus that is so dense that it's more dense than um, your skeletal muscle. And, and that's actually one of the um, kind of specific findings in ABPA where um, you can see it in 18 to 28 percent of patients with ABPA. Um, and then additionally, um, you get your mucoid impaction with you. You can have tree and bud opacities. That's a little bit more, um, more um, nonspecific. And then kind of in the um, more advanced disease, you can get your central bronchiectasis. Um, that's typically more seen in your, um, in your upper lobes. Um, so as you can see, you kind of get, there's a lot of central the bronchiectasis here. Um, and then um, you try to prevent this, but you can also have um, a fibrosis and advanced disease. Um, and so then um, this was just something that ABPAS and ABPACB are, um, if you were just trying to classify ABPA based on your, um, on your radiographic findings. So ABPAS is if they meet the criteria for ABPA but don't have any radiographic findings. And then ABPACB or central bronchiectasis are if they meet clinical criteria and have imaging findings. But we'll, we'll chat more about diagnosis here, um, here in a minute. So in these patients um, with ABPA, um, so a lot of times you'll have your um, most common is more of an obstructive pattern. Um, so you can have your decrease FEV1 due to your air trapping, um, and then you can get air airflow obstruction. 
And then um, with that being said, you have increased residual volume as well. Um, and patients that have progressed to the more um, the um, more kind of chronic forms with fibrosis of AB of their lungs with ABPA, you can have that mixed um, restrictive and obstructive pattern. And you typically do have a decreased DLCO if there is um, bronchiectasis involved. So kind of getting into the specifics of diagnosis, kind of after you've seen those labs and the um, imaging. So like we said, you typically, um, you're going to be thinking about this more in your patients that, um, that have recurrent exacerbations despite adequate treatment of their asthma and or um, um, a little bit less um, a little bit less in our world, but you can have um, CF patients with um, recurrent pulmonary infections and then um, deterioration despite um, despite being on appropriate antibiotics for um, for a presumed CF exacerbation in pulmonary hygiene. And then if you also had gotten your chest X-ray and you saw that mucus plugging and atelectasis, um, and you had eosinophilia and IgE on exam or excuse me on labs. So um, there's no, um, there's a lot of different diagnostic criteria sets. There's no um, one that is like universally agreed upon or are used, um, but the most commonly used um, and uh, seemed to be the more simple one um, was also, um, was called the um, ISHAM criteria or International Society for Human and Animal Mycology. Um, so that's typically the most commonly used. So with that, kind of the specifics of that, you get, um, so you have to have an underlying predisposing condition, whether that's asthma or cystic fibrosis. And then, um, and then you have to have your positive specific IgE level um, to Aspergillus fumigatus and, um, or skin testing, positive skin testing for Aspergillus. And then you also have to have a total um, elevated IgE, usually greater than 1,000. But like we said before, sometimes if other criteria are met, they will consider less than 1,000 to be um, to still qualify. So you have to have all of those with your, so your asthma or CF, and then you have aspergillus evidence um, um, or evidence of specific IgE to aspergillus and um, elevated IgE. But then you can have two out of the three of the following um, with imaging findings consistent with ABPA, or you have serum precipitins um, that are positive to Aspergillus fumigatus, um, or you have a total elevated um, eosinophil count greater than 500. So that's two of the three of those. So this is just kind of a, this is a lot of words, but um, so basically this was just an image from Middleton's that went over the um, various um, different diagnostic criteria. Um, and so um, as you can see over here, this was kind of what we talked about before with um, if you kind of go um, based on your imaging studies as well with your um, ABPA, CB, your central bronchiectasis, and then your um, serologic. But then this was the one that we typically use most commonly, this ISHAM criteria, um, which kind of talked a little bit about, um, which kind of goes into what we talked about with having asthma or CF and then having both of these criteria with elevated IgE and, um, excuse me, and um, evidence of specific IgE to aspergillus, and then having your precipitins or your, um, or your pulmonary findings or um, your elevated eosinophil count, having two of those three. I kind of liked these ISHAM criteria, I thought they were helpful, but it was good to have all these next to each other. So I'm um, thinking about a differential diagnosis with um, ABPA. Um, so you think about, well, do they have asthma just with fungal sensitization, which um, which is possible um, and kind of something we see probably more frequently in, in the PEDS world. Um, and then you can have pulmonary eosinophilia, um, and that can be from your parasitic infections like Loeffler syndrome, um, whether you have your transpulmonary um, passage of larva. Um, and then um, you can have kind of pulmonary eosinophilia from drugs, um, medication reactions, particularly NSAIDs, um, your antimicrobials, or your phenytoin. And then another big diagnosis you think about with, um, if you're thinking about ABPA, is um, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis or your Churg Strauss. Um, so that's another big one to think about. Otherwise, you can have eosinophilic pneumonia, 
um, or chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, or if you just have your um, elevated um, eosinophilia, um, eosinophil counts, excuse me, you can have idiopathic hyper eosinophilic syndromes. And then you also think about neoplasms, um, particularly when you have high eosinophil counts. Um, and then you can have, as far as bronchiectasis goes, um, you think about CF or ciliary dysfunction or just bronchiectasis from frequent infections, um, in particular in cases when you have hypogammaglobulinemia. So um, say they meet all that criteria, all the criteria um, for your um, for your diagnosis on your ICM criteria, um, then um, how do you treat them? So um, a lot of times your goal of treatment is mostly just to control that inflame, inflammation, um, decrease that inflammatory response in that lungs to hopefully improve their clinical symptoms and um, prevent progression um, and help to reduce exacerbations. Um, so typically, um, we think about treatment with ABPA with systemic glucocorticoids, kind of the main, um, the main um, backbone of therapy, particularly in acute ABPA. Um, so there is, um, from what I was reading, there was no particularly specific um, recommendations for dosing as far as steroids, but um, one of the most commonly used regimens that I saw was, I'm kind of starting with oral prednisone, and you start off with, um, you use 0.5 uh, milligrams per kilo per day for a couple weeks, and then um, and then you start to kind of taper after that with your 0.5 mg per kg every other day, um, and tapering to stop around three months. Um, so typically starting with a three-month course for acute ABPA. Um, there had been kind of, um, had been some evidence or, uh, to support, um, or excuse me, there had been some um, uh, case reports of doing kind of higher dosing, but they didn't actually find that that had made any specific difference as far as the, um, the exacerbation frequency. And so typically most will kind of start do this lower dose first since there's no big difference with the higher dose. So then, um, so say they've done their ABPA treatment for, um, for three months or so, and then um, you want to make sure to monitor to make sure they don't have um, recurrence of their ABPA or exacerbations of their ABPA. And so the, um, the big thing we do with that is make sure that we monitor their total serum IgE levels um, and that's um, usually every one to two months. Um, so the, a um, decrease in about 35% from your um, baseline IgE um, or kind of indicates that you've had a good response to steroid therapy. Um, but then a doubling of your total serum Ig from baseline, it usually indicates an uh, acute exacerbation of your ABPA. Um, so um, then if they're in an exacerbation, have had the doubling of their IgE levels and you treat them, um, treat their exacerbation similarly to um, an acute, um, their acute kind of diagnosis. Um, so um, you again treat them with oral prednisone. Typically um, you start with 0.5 to 1 mg per kilo per day for one to two weeks and then um, you start to taper over six to over six to 12 weeks um, until you can get your pre-exacerbation dose kind of achieved. There has been, um, has been reports of doing just monthly pulses of steroids, um, little three-day pulses of steroids to um, try to um, try to decrease the frequency of exacerbations. And um, that appears to be kind of similar to, you kind of have similar exacerbation rates, um, but they don't have to take steroids for um, as frequently, so there was a decrease in um, your side effects from your steroids with just those three-day pulses. So that would be kind of another proposed option. Um, so typically, those high-dose IV steroids are just used in um, life-threatening situations um, or if they have ongoing progression of disease despite being on oral steroids. So typically, um, so typically, high-dose IV steroids are not um, the first line. So then you can also add antifungals such as itraconazole or voriconazole. Um, and that's um, thought to be more so um, added to decrease that antigenic stimulus, um, stimulus within um, those that have steroid-dependent ABPA. So they've had multiple exacerbations and you can't get them off of their um, prednisone. Um, and so those are, those are the steroid-dependent ones are the ones you're thinking about antifungals for. Um, 
And so um, they did see when um, they added itraconazole or voriconazole to your steroid-dependent patients with ABPA, they did get some symptomatic improvement as well as um, overall decreased steroid requirement, decreased exacerbations. So there's a couple proposed regimens for um, itraconazole or voriconazole. Um, of note, both of them, um, do you do start with a loading dose first in the, the adult world, um, and then you put them on maintenance therapy after that for, um, I saw kind of mostly four to six months was, um, was how long you typically keep them on antifungals. Um, but, of course, um, our itraconazole and voriconazole, they, um, our azoles have their CYP450 inhibition, so we have to be um, careful about additional um, medications that are given and then um, monitor them for hepatotoxicity. Um, and then um, if they come off of their antifungals um, and then have recurrence, then they may end up requiring kind of lifelong um, or long-term suppression therapy with, um, with their antifungals. And then for other cases of refractory ABPA, um, so, oops, there we go. Um, then you can give Zoller. Um, then I've seen kind of recommendations of doing 750 milligrams monthly or you do 375 twice monthly. Um, and that can help to reduce exacerbation rates um, and compared to placebos. Um, so that would be, that's kind of something for um, kind of refractory. And then um, they also studied mepolizumab um, that, um, so 100 milligrams every four weeks that have shown some promise with that. Um, but then they did not recommend doing kind of antifungal immunotherapy for these patients. Um, so this was a um, kind of just a very busy slide, but um, essentially it just shows that um, you can go from the different staging of ABPA as far as being an acute therapy or um, kind of having acute ABPA and then their response after you treat with steroids and then kind of um, when you would consider them to be in an exacerbation. Um, and so this was just um, a slide depicting just the, the um, overall staging of it, but um, certainly, hopefully not something to memorize. So um, that, was, um, that was ABPA. And I will kind of move on to um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So, um, so hypersensitivity pneumonitis is also called extrinsic allergic alveolitis. Um, and what it is is an inappropriate immunologic response to an inhaled antigen um, in susceptible individuals. Um, and typically it's characterized by bouts of shortness of breath and fever after, you've, um, after patients have had this exposure. So it's overall, it's, um, it's a pretty good, it's um, similar to ABPA in some ways anyways. Um, so farmer's lung is one of the most common um, forms of AB, or excuse me, of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, and that was kind of one of the first described, um, particularly in the early 1900s when um, farmers were reported to have episodic fevers after exposure um, to hay, and straw, and moldy grains. Um, and then after that, multiple other inhaled antigens um, have now been known to cause hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, there's a, um, a long list of, um, of potential antigens. Most of them are organic, um, fungal, bacterial, um, avian, and more vegetable matter, but they can have some that are inorganic as well, such as zinc and isocyanates. And um, so those inorganic molecules kind of serve as haptins and, um, and bind to albumin. And then when they do that, they become antigenic. There can be some regional variations kind of across the country based on um, domestic exposures or occupational exposures. So um, this was a, kind of a table in, um, in Middleton's kind of going over the causes of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So um, birds is one of the biggest, one, um, biggest ones with like bird fanciers, lung, um, and so exposures to birds. And then you think of exposures to molds, particularly your farmers or um, those that um, kind of have humidifiers or household mold. And then um, 
and then you can see multiple other molds on there too. Um, interestingly, you can also get um, kind of saxophone or uh, saxophone player um, can get hypersensitivity pneumonitis from buildup of mold within their within their saxophones. And I assume that's not specific just for the saxophone. It can be from all um, from all instrument um, wind instrument players. And then you can also get hot tub lung and then metal working lung from mycobacteria. Um, and then it has a list of your chemicals with your isocyanates and zinc and so, as well as nickel. And these are just some of the, um, some of the causes. There's, um, there's further. So as far as kind of the, um, how um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis starts, so um, the antigens um, kind of serve as immune stimulants, um, kind of similar to, similar to ABPA. Um, so the antigens are um, typically pretty small and are inhaled. And then when they're inhaled down into the alveoli, they, um, they trigger an immune complex, um, immune complex reaction. So immune complexes form, and then um, you primarily after that get your T-cell mediated inflammation within the alveoli. So early on in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, you have almost predominantly your Th1, um, Th1 response. And then later on, you have Th2 skewed responses um, with your inflammation. Um, so um, a lot of times they um, have found that um, the immune response is, is further, further exacerbated, exacerbated and activated when um, patients have been exposed to a concurrent viral infection around the time that they're exposed to that antigen. Um, so typically requires kind of heavier frequent exposure to that antigen. Um, and so a lot of times these are occupational exposures or, um, or frequent hobbies. So this was um, kind of similar to our um, ABA BA picture. This was a similar picture of the pathogenesis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, that's from Middleton's. So as you can see up here, you typically have your very frequent or heavy exposures to your antigens, um, whether that's mold, bird, chemicals, mycobacteria, kind of any of that list that we saw previously. Um, and then um, a lot of times you do have um, you do have compounding kind of viral infections around that time that further stimulate that response. Um, and then they also talked a little bit about kind of having patients that have genetic susceptibility to having this, um, but they aren't quite sure exactly what that genetic susceptibility is yet. Um, so um, you're exposed to that, and then you're um, that's kind of inhaled down into um, the alveoli, and you form immune complexes, um, which then your immune complexes are um, are going to activate your complement, and then um, and then complement is going to recruit your macrophages, um, which um, are going to release your CXCL8, um, CCL5, and CCL3. Um, which are going to cause neutrophilic recruitment. Um, and then, so your neutrophilic recruitment is going to mostly lead to your Th1 predominant um, response in um, your acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis um, and can lead to your tissue damage and fibrosis. And then um, kind of up here, you can see the um, alternate pathway. So, um, or another kind of way that it causes, um, causes inflammation in the lungs. Um, is that leads to um, your Th1 and Th2 response where leads to leads to those large influx of lymphocytes within the alveoli, um, and um, you're going to have reduced lymphocyte apoptosis, um, and then you can have abnormal Treg function um, with that. So then that leads to um, excessive lymphocytes within your alveoli, which leads to your um, to further kind of damage and inflammatory response. So kind of later on in your subacute or chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, then um, you get your um, increase in IL-4 and IL-13, um, and then your decrease in your interferon gamma, which is going to um, lead to that, um, to your subacute and chronic um, pneumonitis. And then, again, it all kind of leads to tissue damage and fibrosis. So, um, overall, the presentation um, of kind of getting into the presentation of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, so um, it's pretty dependent on the duration and um, quantity of your antigen exposure, um, as well as kind of stage of disease. So um, there's um, typically we think of stages of disease and hypersensitivity pneumonitis as acute, um, subacute, or chronic. 
Um, and they can all have very similar symptoms, um, kind of just um, vary a little bit depending on duration of exposure as well as, um, as, well as findings on exam. Um, so um, you kind of think about as far as your clinical history, um, think about um, the durations and environmental exposures. And so I found this table on um, up to date, which I thought was helpful as far as kind of recognition of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, as far as when to even think about it. Um, so particularly in, um, in patients that have a history of kind of a fever with cough and shortness of breath and um, concerning for, uh, for an atypical pneumonia or infection processes, but that it occurs, those symptoms occur um, most frequently um, after a known exposure, whether that be at work or, um, or um, you start thinking about it if it's only a certain time or place or time of the, um, time of the year. Um, or if you think about it in patients that have new, had new exposures and um, develop symptoms after moving to a new job or home, um, or if their symptoms are particularly worse at work and not, um, not as significant at home. And then you kind of think about, you have to ask about those specific hobbies, um, including kind of having pets, especially birds, um, or um, some that have kind of the down, down pillows. Um, and then um, kind of people that have um, hobbies with fur or plants um, or wind instrument players, like we talked about, um, if there's kind of water damage and um, water damage in the home. Um, and then you think about those that even like hot tubs or jacuzzis um, and then air conditioning kind of units, um, air coolers. Um, so you think a lot about, yeah, the workplace exposures and then you have to think about some of these kind of unusual things to ask about, particularly if it's something that's not super straightforward as to the cause of their symptoms. So um, acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis, so typically you think of symptoms that start, um, it typically start pretty abruptly within, um, usually within um, eight hours of exposure, um, it usually occurs, occurs a little bit sooner, but um, up to eight hours or so after exposure. Um, and those symptoms can actually um, last up to about a month. Um, and so um, you think of that with, they can appear like a pulmonary infuc infection with fever, um, they have cough and shortness of breath, um, headaches, myalgia, um, nausea, and sweating. Um, and on lung exam, you might see that they have, um, a lot of times it can be normal, but they can also have diffuse crackles. And then if you did PFTs on these patients, you might see, um, you might see impaired diffusion capacity um, and then potentially restrictive pattern, but at this point in time, they probably don't have a, a big restrictive pattern yet. Um, and then chest x-ray um, can be normal. A lot of times it is normal or they can have diffuse granularity. And then if you did a CT scan in, um, for patients with um, acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis, you might see um, micronodules or ground glass opacities. Um, you might see mostly a continuation or that mediastinal lymphadenopathy. So in subacute um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, the, um, these symptoms, they have similar symptoms to acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, although fever is somewhat less common. Some of those constitutional symptoms like fever, weight loss, and malaise are a little bit less common than in acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, so typically you're going to have shortness of breath and cough that are your most prominent um, and that can develop after days to weeks of exposure to that antigen. On lung exam, you typically are going to see diffuse crackles in these patients um, and on pulmonary function testing, you could get, um, you will get a diffusion defect as well as you can start to see that restrictive pattern um, a little bit more commonly. Um, CT scan, again, you might see your micronodular pattern and ground glass opacities. A lot of times it's more central and does spare the periphery. And in chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, a lot of times these patients have been exposed to the antigen for um, you know, months and years, and symptoms take a, quite a while to develop. Um, and um, symptoms um, are similar to subacute, so include more of your shortness of breath and cough. Um, your constitutional symptoms are, are somewhat less likely, um, but you can get some um, weight loss with it as well. And so on exam, you might, in these patients with their prolonged um, 
kind of prolonged process, you can actually see your digital clubbing on these patients with hypoxia um, and then crackles. Um, on your pulmonary function tests, on your chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis, you can again get your restrictive lung disease seen with a decreased lung capacity um, and then you decreased um, gas transfer um, or decreased DLCO. Um, although patients with these, um, with chronic, can actually get um, a little bit of an obstructive pattern sometimes if they have had emphysematous changes or, um, or kind of pulmonary blebs and from, um, from their um, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So on chest x-ray, you could see um, evidence of interstitial lung disease, and um, these patients can have fibrosis and honeycombing. Um, and then, um, again, you can also have your, um, it is possible to have your emphysematous kind of changes, especially in smokers. Um, and so on CT scan, again, you're going to see a lot of your, um, you can see your air trapping. Um, fibrosis and honeycombing are certainly more common in chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And then you can get a reticular pattern and with traction bronchiectasis. And then those micronodules, again, that are the periphery. So again, so this is a photo here from Middleton's again, um, kind of demonstrating a little bit more of the, um, the CT findings in um, subacute and chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, and so um, you can see um, a little bit more, you can see these little bit of these blebs um, and um, this kind of ground glass opacities here. And, um, and then you can also, again, kind of see um, here are these more, again, more of the blebs here, um, mostly in the central portions of the lung. So as far as kind of diagnosis of, specific diagnosis of these patients, kind of after you have that, um, that clinical suspicion. So again, it's mostly based on, um, a lot of it's based on history and that very specific history we talked about earlier. Um, as far as um, exposures and occupational exposures and, and pets and, and um, kind of unusual hobbies. Um, and so a lot of times your exposure to the offending agent um, will happen within that eight hours of having those symptoms. Um, and so then you kind of, it's a conglomeration of to your imaging findings like we talked about in your pulmonary function tests. Um, but then um, you typically, um, a lot of times you can get um, serum precipitins or precipitating antibodies against that suspected antigen, the suspected antigen um, for these patients. Um, it's a little bit more reflective of exposure rather than um, indicative of disease. Um, so it is, um, so it can be sensitive, but it's not, um, not as specific for um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, they did note that um, if you can get kind of more of a standardized um, a standardized preparations for um, your precipitating um, for your antigens anyways, then you can have a little bit more um, a little bit more specificity with it. And then um, typically these patients do have um, re um, excuse me repeat symptoms after re-exposure to that antigen. Um, and you can, um, if the diagnosis is in question, you can do an, an inhalation challenge. Um, and it's not routinely used anymore um, as it's not standardized, but it can be helpful, um, particularly in those with occupational exposures. Or if you need to, um, if you need to definitively kind of look at if they have repeat symptoms after exposure. Um, and so in these patients, you um, can get a bronchoalveolar lavage, um, which um, typically you're going to see more of your alveolar lymphocytosis, um, which is um, nonspecific, but is the most common thing that you're going to see in, um, in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And you can also get increased IL-17 in, um, in that BL, BAL fluid. And then um, if all of the above are... Um, are you, there's diagnosis is still in question, then you can do um, a lung biopsy on these patients. So if you did get a biopsy um, on these patients, then the pathology um, kind of depends again on um, the stage of the disease. So in acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis, you can see neutrophilic and eosinophilic inflammation of the airway um, of the alveoli, and then you can get a, a small vessel vasculitis. And then 
Um, and then subacute findings, you can get a bronchiolitic type picture, um, and then you can get lymphocytic alveoli, um, alveolitis um, with interstitial infiltrate of lymphocytes with lymphocytes, and then you can um, get these non-necrotizing granulomas. And then in chronic, you get distortion of the lung architecture with emphyseminous changes in cysts, um, and then you can get some bridging fibrosis um, between, the, between those cysts. So um, this was a picture of um, chronic, um, the chronic um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And so you can see these. They also talked a little bit about uh, multinucleated giant cells that you can see. Um, and then you can see kind of these bigger blebs with lung architecture distortion. And then there's a lot of these interstitial um, kind of this um, lymphocytes that you can see within the tissue there. So um, as far as some um, predictors for, um, for making the diagnosis, and um, then um, there was um, this table also in Middleton's that talked a little bit about which, um, which predictors are most, most prominent in hypersensitive pneumonitis and could be helpful. And, um, and so in um, exposure to the offending antigen, um, if you've taken the history and you know that they have that exposure, then they are typically 39 times more likely to have hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, and then um, the next following that is um, if your symptoms develop 48 hours after that exposure, um, then that increases your odds by 7.2%. Um, and then you can have, again, it kind of talks about your precipitating antibodies um, as well as your recurrence episodes of symptoms and then your weight loss with it and inspiratory crackles. So that was kind of helpful as far as um, if you're trying to um, weigh in um, how much each particular thing contributes to the diagnosis. Um, so this was um, this was another table that I um, was able to find out up to date, just kind of talking about how the different criteria, um, different criteria to meet that make the diagnosis of um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, and so I thought that that was helpful as far as kind of taking a look through um, through these and um, then compiling these into making it kind of prob probable um, or subclinical or if it's just sensitization um, or if they do have kind of definitive hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And so some of the things that they looked at were, um, again, kind of the history of appropriate exposure or known exposure to that um, offending antigen was um, the one that was um, the odds ratio was 39% more likely to have hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, and so the ways you can kind of look at that, if they've had that exposure, are um, if they have kind of, um, if they have that um, history of the exposure or if they have kind of confirmed, um, confirmed kind of in environmental investigations or you have that serum precipitants that are positive in these patients. And then you can kind of look at if they've had, um, again, you look at their um, CT scans um, as well as spirometry and then chest x-rays. Um, and then if you did do, um, did do a BAL, again, um, BAL with lymphocytosis is, again, the most, um, um, the most common thing that you're going to see in those patients. And then it talked about if you did an um, inhalation challenge or if you got histopathology. So I thought that that was kind of overall helpful in um, and making that decision or making that diagnosis. So the differential diagnosis for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So um, you can have viral um, viral causes of infection of um, excuse me, viral causes that can look like hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So um, viral or bacterial, um, particularly CMV pneumonitis um, on the viral side can um, cause a similar picture. Um, and then I uh, talked a little bit about inhalation fever, um, where typically you have, um, can appear very similar, but um, you can, um, where it's appear very similar to hypersensitivity pneumonitis, where you have an exposure and four to 12 hours later, you typically develop fevers, chills, headaches, um, but then your pulmonary findings are, um, are normal in that case. And then organic dust toxin syndrome um, is, um, is more common in farmers. Um, and so that's something that so they develop kind of fevers and chills, um, dyspnea starting about four to six hours after exposure, um, but they don't have, um, they have negative serologic testing. 
Um, and so this I was reading is actually um, a much more common in farmers than farmer's lung. And then there's another thing called fire eater's lung, um, where you get aspiration of flammable organic solvents um, during fire eating demonstrations. Um, and then other kind of um, less odd um, <laughs> or less unusual um, things on the diet. Differential include chronic bronchitis or interstitial pulmonary fibrosis or other causes of interstitial lung disease. So treatment of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So um, the biggest thing um, is um, removal of the offending agent. Um, so that can be kind of workplace mitigation, kind of um, environmental interventions, removing of any of those birds or feather bedding that are in kind of in the home. Um, and kind of sterilizing those vaporizers um, or humidifiers and then avoiding hot tubs. Um, and those are just some of them. Um, and of, of course, it kind of depends on what the offending agent is. Um, and so then acute and subacute hypersensitivity and pneumonitis are actually reversible um, with, um, with overall very good prognosis with complete recovery within a month of elimination of that antigen exposure. And then um, typically you follow them up in 6 to 12 weeks or so to make sure they're still doing well, doing, make sure their pulmonary function tests are, are looking good. Um, and then um, otherwise, so um, typically steroids are not um, recommended kind of as first um, kind of right away in patients with like acute or subacute. But if they have particularly um, per particular impairment with it, um, um, they're definitely, they're more symptomatic and they have abnormal lung functions. Um, and then you can do um, a short course of oral steroids to kind of help with that recovery. Um, but it has not been shown to kind of improve the long-term prognosis. Um, but it can be used if, um, if necessary. Mm -hmm. And then in chronic um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, again, antigen avoidance is one of the biggest things. Um, um, but um, antigen avoidance does not cause their, um, you can't get complete changing of or reversibility of your abnormal lung findings um, with just antigen removal. And so typically steroids are uh, more helpful in these patients. Um, so you do a trial of kind of oral steroids, um, particularly if they have inflammatory changes noted. So if they have those ground glass opacities on, um, on their CT scan, um, if they have evidence of granulomas on biopsy or if they have BAL lymphocytosis. And so they recommended a kind of a 0.5 mg per kg per day kind of starting there for 48 weeks and then gradually tapering um, over, um, gr gradually tapering to stop at about three months or so. Um, and then um, they recommended if you don't see any improvement with the steroids to, um, to not continue them beyond three months. Um, other things that um, kind of other options, particularly in patients that are not steroid responsive um, for chronic, chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis include immunosuppressants to kind of dampen that immune response. Um, and that includes azathioprine or, um, or Celsept. And then if patients are very, have very extensive fibrosis and a poor prognosis, you can consider a lung transplant. Um, so these are um, just, if we have a few minutes left, these are just some of the questions that were in the, at the end of that Middleton's chapter, um, which um, I thought were um, kind of overall good to go through. Um, so... Um, so the first question is, which of the following is not part of the International Society for Human and Animal Mycology or the ISHAM criteria we talked about um, for the diagnosis of ABPA? So kind of A, total serum Ig greater than 1,000, um, B, detection of aspergillus on um, lung biopsy, um, C, elevated aspergillus specific IgE, um, D, bronchiectasis on high-resolution CT scan, or um, D, um, elevated total eosinophil count. Um, and so um, with that, um, if anyone knows the answer, they can shout it out. Otherwise, I can go ahead and um, plug along to the next slide. Isn't it detection of aspergillus on lung biopsy? Yep. Yep, thanks, Sean. Um, 
Yep. So the um, yep. So the ICM criteria just kind of um, just kind of summing up that again and reviewing that with um, for ABPA. So um, your obligatory criteria are um, that you should have skin testing sensitivity or um, to aspergillus um, or elevated specific IgE to aspergillus, and then you have to have your total IgE elevated greater than a thousand. And then at least two of the three, so being serum precipitants to aspergillus, um, radiographic findings or EOs greater than 500. But, um, but like Sean said, um, lung biopsy is not um, necessary in these patients. Hannah? Uh -huh. Hannah? Yep. Um, go, can you go back? Yep. When you talk about, like, the precipitants or the precipitating uh -huh. um, antibodies, like, is that just... Like, if we were actually trying to order that in our system, is that, like, aspergillus IgG? Is that, like, the thing that we would be ordering? Or what exactly is there a I precipitin's think, order? To be honest, I have not ordered it in Cerner before. Um, I would think that you could just do aspergillus IgG. Um, but I guess I'm not 100% sure I haven't ordered it in Cerner before. Um, I know I that... I think we might have an ABPA algorithm in search for okay. like Lexus IgE and IgG. Maybe okay. someone can correct me if that's wrong. Yeah, I should have looked that up kind of prior to doing this to, as far as how we actually order these things. There's a there's actually an ABA, ABPA panel that's in Cerner mm. <clears throat> because it's more than just aspergillus. They have some other ones, and I, I think they're done through Viacor. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, so then this was the other question. One of the other questions was, you know, which of the following about hypersensitive neuronitis is correct? So um, BAL neutrophilia um, supports the diagnosis of HP. Um, BAL CD4 to CD8 ratio less than 1 is diagnostic for um, HP. Um, BAL CD4 to CD8 ratio is greater than 1 is diagnostic. Um, BAL lymphocytosis supports the diagnosis of hypersensitive neuronitis, or um, BAL eosinophilia supports the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. it is, so D is actually the correct answer. So BAL lymphocytosis supports the diagnosis of hypersensitive neuronitis. Um, so um, one thing that, um, that I did note was that, so... Um, there can be, there has been some back and forth on these as far as like, um, um, as far as thinking that, so typically your CD8, if you're think, kind of board review book and um, has that CD8 is typically going to be higher. So then this would, um, so it, it talks about this one, but the thing is it's not diagnostic for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And um, because in some cases they have also seen a, a ratio greater than one, so they um, so the answer then was um, was BAL lymphocytosis was supportive of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So there's no like specific ratio um, that is diagnostic for sure, but um, CD8 greater uh, higher CD8 count is um, supportive but not diagnostic. I've I've seen that question where they said is where they have that and put as suggestive of or something like that it doesn't say necessarily diagnostic but that question I've seen on the boards and the in services before <clears throat> or okay. something similar to that because okay. that was that was a classic <clears throat> um, question you had to, you had to know the difference between what was the di what would what would you see on BAL and in hypersensitivity pneumonitis and what would you see on BAL and uh, like ABPA mm, okay. So, so you said you previously saw it where it was where they it was where, this, but it was supportive. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember if they said it was diagnostic, but they asked like they, you know, like what would you find on um, the BAL? You know, was um, and so um, and they uh, they would classically give you know the different CD4 and CD8 ratios, um, and that was um, what they usually ask. So just kind of keep that in mind that it still may. Uh, you just have to read the question carefully, I guess. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, oops. <laughs> um, so then this one, let's see. Okay. Last one, sorry. Which of the following about hypersensitivity is incorrect? 
Um, so A, the post-transplant survival in hypersensitivity is better than idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. B, granulomas can be seen in lung biopsy samples of patients with hypersensitive pneumonitis. Um, a C, both obstructed and restrictive defects can be observed. Um, D, randomized um, controlled trials have shown systemic steroids improve outcomes in patients with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and um, E, nickel exposures can cause hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So which one is incorrect? And then the answer there is um, D. So it talks about how um, how systemic steroids um, overall. There's no no randomized controlled trials that show that um, that yes. they overall improve the prognosis and outcomes of hypersensitivity. Right. Um, this is kind of a bad time for me right now. Okay. And that's it. So that was good time. Does yeah. anybody have any questions? Anna, that, that was a great presentation. I, I always enjoy seeing it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess they overlap and they have certain differences too, and certainly important questions arise. So I think you did a nice job pointing out the differences too. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I think Paul may be busy. So we'll go ahead and conclude this part here. And then um, you guys want to take a, a short little break before we move on to Jeopardy?